Hi, and welcome back to the Biological Psychology video course. In this video, video 6.4, we're going to take a look at sleep and dreams. Now, so let's start with the very basic question. What is sleep? Sleep is characterized by low levels of physical activity, right? So if an animal or a human is sleeping, generally speaking, uh, that person or animal doesn't do much. Low body temperature, your, your, your body temperature goes down if you're asleep and reduced or perhaps an altered form of consciousness, right? There is something to be said for the idea that if you're sleeping, especially if you have vivid dreams, that that is a level of consciousness, but it is definitely very different from the consciousness that we have during alert wakefulness. So why do we sleep? That is a very uh, good question and one that we don't really have an answer to, but there are a few possible functions. So one function is uh, that we sleep to allow the body to restore. Now, that, I think that is an answer that you will hear quite often, but it is essentially a non-answer. I think it is, it is kind of, it, it tricks you into thinking that it's an answer, but it's not really, because it leaves the question open of what it means to restore, right? What, what exactly does it mean for our body to restore? I mean, I understand that I can be tired, and then when I sleep, I wake up and I'm, I'm, I'm rest, rested again, but what exactly happened? What is this restoration process that happened? Um, and why is it not possible to, to restore while we are awake, right? So I can imagine that if you've been, if you've exercised a lot of visual, uh, physical activity, that your muscles need some time maybe to restore, whatever that may mean. But why is it not enough to simply sit down in a chair, wait for a little bit, bit and then get up again, right? Why do we need to sleep? In other words, I would say that allowing the body to restore as an answer to the question, why do we sleep, is not a very satisfactory answer. Here's another answer. Uh, conserving energy during inefficient periods. That's kind of sounds kind of abstract, but it, the idea is very simple. And I think it's actually a very uh, insightful, uh, insightful uh, answer. So the idea is for us, the night is an inefficient period because in, at night, we are not going to hunt for food. We are not going to pick berries. We simply, we're just wasting energy really, right? It is not a period for us in which we do anything that is useful for our existence. So the best thing that we can do then, if it is night, is simply shut down and use as little energy as possible. And that's why we go to sleep, simply to conserve energy until it, it becomes light again. And then we can, can start doing things again that make sense, right? Uh, that help us survive, right? So essentially sleep is a way to skip those periods of the day that are not very useful to us. Another function of sleep is memory consolidation. Now. This is an answer to some extent. It is certainly true that memory consolidation does happen during sleep. So if you have learned something and then you sleep, then you know that better when you wake up, right? You've learned it better when you wake up. That, no, there's no doubt that that is the case. It, the question is whether we would really, whether we really need sleep in order to do that, or whether it would also have been possible for us to have some form of memory consolidation that does not require sleep, right? Is memory consolidation really why we sleep, you could say? Or do we happen to perform memory consolidation during sleep because we were not doing much else during sleep to begin with? So I think memory consolidation is not really a very satisfactory answer to why we sleep, even though we clearly do exhibit memory consolidation during sleep. Um, so, but we don't know why we sleep, not really. To me, the, the idea that, we, that it conserves energy during inefficient periods is the most attractive idea, but honestly, we don't really know. Uh, but we do know that sleep is clearly important and that if you don't sleep enough, that is very bad for you. And if you really don't sleep enough, eventually you will die, right? So sleeping is really an important, uh, important aspect of life. You should get enough sleep. Um, and you don't need to know why in order to do that. Now, sleep is often subdivided into different stages. Um, two general stages are generally separated. Stages without rapid eye movement, uh, non-REM sleep, so REM stands for rapid eye movement. And these, this, the rapid eye movements are, are, are literal, right? In the stages uh, with rapid eye movement, uh, these are, those stages are called such, or that stage, stage five is called such because our eyes really move rapidly. And even though the eyes are closed, you can see the eyes move rapidly behind the eyelids. And so in, in stages one to four of sleep, our eyes do not really move very rapidly. And in stage five, our eyes do move very rapidly. And that is an important distinction that we make. Um, and these stages are traversed in more or less a fixed order. 
So this is just an observation. We don't really understand why and what that means, but clearly that is what happens. So stage one of sleep is non-REM. So we, our eyes don't really move. And it's kind of a transition between wakefulness and sleep, very similar to just be, being really relaxed and characterized by a particular type of brain activity that is called alpha and theta waves, which are low frequency, high amplitude brain waves. So essentially, if you would measure a lot of sleep research is done with EEG, where we measure electrical activity on the scalp. And if you measure, if you measure low frequency, high amplitude brain waves, then you know the person may be in stage one, uh, stage one sleep, even though we don't really know what that means or what that signifies. Now, if people are uh, awoken during stage one sleep, they often claim that they haven't slept, right? And this is actually uh, quite common in sleep. If uh, people are very bad at, at knowing whether they slept or not, and for example, people who are exhibit insomnia, which is a very awful thing to suffer from, uh, sleep more than they uh, than they claim, right? So if you, for example, if you've had a very bad night and you feel like I haven't slept at all, that's probably not true. You probably did sleep a very large proportion of the night. It's just that you slept very poorly and you didn't really rest very well, right? Um, now, then we have stage two sleep. Stage two sleep is again non-REM sleep. And if you measure EEG, it is characterized by theta waves interrupted by brief bursts of activity. Uh, then we have stage three and four, slow wave sleep. They're very similar, right? They're distinguished for a reason that to me is not clear, but they are very similar stages of sleep. Again, non-REM characterized by so-called delta waves, which are even more low frequency and high amplitude than the alpha and theta waves. Now, and if you wake someone up during stage three or four sleep, they often feel very groggy, right? So it is really a type of sleep. You should not wake up during stage three or four sleep. It makes you feel bad for whatever reason. And then we have stage five sleep, and that's the REM sleep. And that's the most famous form of sleep, sometimes also called paradoxical sleep. When it was studied first with, with animals, people tended to call it paradoxical sleep. Nowadays, people tend to call it uh, REM sleep, but it's the same thing. And it's accompanied by eye movements with the eyes closed. And the brain activity is very similar to, to uh, your brain activity during wakefulness. And it's strongly associated with dreaming. So... It, it seems to be the case, to some extent at least, that during REM sleep, stage five sleep, you are basically conscious to some extent in your dreams and you are doing all kinds of things and your eye movements reflect that, right? So you're essentially looking around in your dreams, you could say, and in real life, your eyes also move. Uh, the rest of your body is paralyzed um, and that is presumably why you are not actually moving, right? So your, your body movements are inhibited, you are paralyzed so that you don't really exercise your dreams, which would be very dangerous, of course. But the exception being your eyes, because you can freely move your eyes, right? That's not dangerous. So presumably that's why your eyes are not paralyzed during REM sleep. That's the idea. Um, so it used to be uh, said that dreaming was exclusive to uh, REM sleep. Nowadays, I think it's clear that dreaming occurs to some extent in other stages of sleep as well, although they might be different forms of dreaming. So, for example, REM sleep have, is really that kind of storytelling, narrative uh, dreaming, where you really have some kind of adventure, right? You're experiencing something, a vivid dream. Whereas the, uh, dreams in the other stages of sleep may be more uh, emotions or pictures, right? So, for example, the feeling that you're falling is not really a story that's unfolding, right? It's not really what you would dream during REM sleep, but it may be an, it's, it's a dream of sorts, nevertheless, and it probably happens during different types of uh, different stages of sleep. Now, now that we've talked a little bit about dreaming, what are dreams really? Dreams are these, well, they are these narratives that happen when you're asleep, right? Or feelings that you have when you're asleep. We know very little about dreams. Um, best we know, dreams are essentially pretty much random activity that is based on recent experiences, right? So we tend to dream about recent experience or th experiences or thoughts. If we have... If you've experienced something that was quite salient during the day, you're quite likely to dream about it. If you have been on your phone, uh, on, on Facebook Messenger, Messenger until 3, 3 a.m. before you all fall asleep, you're quite like, likely to dream about that, right? Because that's then very salient and on your mind. Now, the idea is that basically this happens because uh, activity that you, that you had in your brain before you were asleep is very easily activated. So basically, if you have some, if you were thinking about a person, that person is already kind of half activated in your in your brain. And then when there is some random activation, that person becomes really active and you start dreaming about that person, right? 
that does not really answer the question why also, for example, there are a lot of very stereotyped dreams, right? That, that things like dreaming that you are naked in a socially inappropriate situation, uh, dreaming that you have things in your mouth, dreaming, you know, there, very, there are very various quite stereotyped dreams that a lot of people have. Um, why that is, is to, to, as far as I know, not, not, not really known. Now, when we talk about dreams, I think we cannot uh, not talk about Sigmund Freud, however much I would like to not talk about Sigmund Freud, because Sigmund Freud famously proposed that dreams have a deeper meaning, right? So, and he talked about the manifest content, um, which is what the dream really was. So you might, for example, dream that your teeth are loose in your mouth. That's another very common dream that people have. And then, according to Freud, that, that dream is not really about your teeth being loose in your mouth, but it conveys some kind of deeper meaning. There's some latent content. And for example, in this case, that might mean that you have very little self-confidence, right? So according to Sigmund Freud and other people, um, your dreams are like symbols. And if you know how to interpret those symbols, you can sort of figure out what's on someone's mind. Now, Dreams do kind of represent something, but I think they represent something in fairly trivial ways in the sense that they represent to some degree what is, has been on your mind. But the idea, even though this is still a popular belief, the idea that dreams reflect in any meaningful way um, something else than what they manifestly are is, uh, as far as I know, completely unsupported by any evidence. It's probably complete nonsense. So don't start interpreting your dreams in this kind of, with these dream interpretation things. They don't really mean anything. If you if you dream that you, you stand in front of your class naked, uh, then that is a form of embarrassment that's probably been on your mind, but there's not some kind of very deeper meaning there that you can disentangle by, uh, by, by some kind of Freudian uh, logic, right? Dreams are probably quite trivial in that, uh, in that respect. Now, with that, we've arrived at the end of this section on, uh, on attention and consciousness. Thank you very much uh, for your attention.